I am Nate Angel. Uh, I'm calling in from cloudy and rainy Portland, Oregon, which is very typical for Portland, Oregon. So it's no big surprise, although it's lasting a little bit longer into June than it normally does this year. Um, and uh, I'm also a uh, grateful but unwelcome guest on what we call the Nevchwana uh, indigenous people's lands, uh, where there's a numerous uh, indigenous peoples have called this Multnomah Valley their historical home. And so I'm very thankful to be here. <clears throat> and I would like to um, kick off this session today, which is the kickoff session for week three of the Open Learning Journey track at MyFest 22. Wow, that's a, that's such a mouthful to say. But we've been um, we've been doing this Open Learning Journey track. Um, uh, and if you've missed the first couple of weeks, that's no problem because there are recordings of the events. But this is our third week where we're really going to be focused in on um, questions about how we can grow and expand open education, open learning practices, open educational resources, and so forth um, <clears throat> at institutions and or across consortiums so that they can sort of have more sticking power. And so uh, I've invited a whole bunch of folks here today. We've invited a whole bunch of folks here today who have experience doing that either at their own institutions or at multiple institutions. And um, we're gonna ask them some specific questions and have a discussion. But before we do that, uh, I wanna, just so that we can kind of get to know each other a little bit better, I'm going to create some random breakout rooms of just two people each. So there'll be two people in each room and we'll give you a chance to meet each other. And I think that um, <clears throat> it's often helpful to have a sort of prompt to uh, have that discussion with. And so what I'm thinking of, you could talk about whatever you want once you're there, but what I'm thinking of would be, uh, it would be really interesting for each other to share uh, when you first became aware of open learning and sort of what made you interested in it. Um, it may even be today. Maybe today is your first exposure to it. I highly doubt that because I see a lot of familiar faces here in the room. But so just um, maybe explore a little bit your, your beginnings uh, with open education. Uh, and we will um, have a five minute discussion in those breakout rooms. And then we'll all come back here to the main room uh, and start the, the formal program, even though it's not gonna be very formal. So um, I'd also like to invite everybody to use chat uh, throughout the meeting um, as a way to kind of annotate what's going on on screen. Um, as people know, I have a long history with annotation as well, and so I always try to make everything sound like it's an annotation, just like someone else who happens to be in this meeting, which is my co-host, Remy Clear. And so while I get the breakout rooms set up, Remy, would you like to say hello to the folks? Yeah, greetings, everyone. My name is Remy Clear. Um, I'm joining you today from the ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute people, where uh, Denver, Colorado is located, as well as my university, University of Colorado, Denver. Um, I want to just give a big shout out to Nate, who's doing an incredible job behind the scenes, publicly organizing the open learning journey. Um, Nate's really just done uh, incredible work, um, so much that I want to be thankful for. And I just want to mention that this is, as I said, the third week. If you're joining us for the first time or you've been with us along the way, um, the very first week was intended to be a broad introduction to what we think of as open in learning and in formal educational spaces. We had a whole panel of incredible guests who kind of challenged us conceptually, ethically, and politically to think about a variety of dimensions of open that um, resource and recording is available to you online. In the second week, last week of this open learning journey, we had a more tool specific focus and we looked at a variety of specific platforms either for publishing or for creating, or even as Nate said, for annotating to assist open learning in a pretty hands-on sense. And as Nate said, the focus of today's session, really the theme of this final week is to think about how this occurs more sustainably and systemically, particularly in institutions of higher education. And we are just so thankful to everyone who's agreed to be a part of our work today. So thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us. Again, thanks, Nate, for really doing so much new organizing work. And are the breakout rooms ready? They are. Well, so, hey, I hope everybody had a chance to get to know each other a little bit better in your breakout rooms. Thanks for... Um, Thanks for having that little that little moment. I um, I think it provides a chance for to build a little bit of community around this this small experience that we're having today. So um, 
Uh, I thought that we would take this moment now to actually um, ask our invited guests um, a couple of key questions. And I actually, I want to start with Alyssa because I know that she has to leave early, if that's okay with you. <laughs> that's that's your penalty for leaving early is you get to kick oh, things Oh, man. Up. No, it's, it's all good. Um, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to participate in the in this panel. Um, my, uh, my name is Alyssa Bigelow, and uh, I'm joining you from Ontario, Canada. Uh, I'm about 45 minutes north of um, Toronto, uh, north of the GTA. Um, so I, uh, I currently am with uh, eCampus Ontario, which is a not-for-profit uh, government-funded um, e uh, consortium. And uh, our, our mission is to support post-secondary educators and the educational system uh, with tech-enabled learning and digital transformation initiatives. Uh, so we provide supports, we provide access to platforms, we, uh, and we've been providing support for um, a very unique uh, fund opportunity called a virtual learning strategy uh, most recently. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm happy to expand on that um, anytime. And uh, is that what you're going for, Nate? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thank you for introducing yourself as I was going to ask each each person to do that. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you personally got involved in open education? Um, and then, uh, so you guys at eCampus Ontario, as I understand it, work across like a whole range of institutions across Ontario, the province, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe so we could understand a little bit more about um, how eCampus Ontario specifically supports open education across the province. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the virtual learning strategy that was um, recently launched um, is uh, an opportunity for faculty and educators in the province to develop and create and adapt open educational resources. Uh, so we had we just finished uh, round one earlier this year, and um, we had I think six hundred plus uh, new open educational resources um, developed and, and uh, put into our repository. Um, a few years ago, we started the Open Library, the Ontario Open Library, um, which is uh, similar to BC campuses initiatives with their uh, open library as well, um, which is a, a big repository that um, houses OERs and direct links to, to different OERs. Um, and this VLS um, initiative uh, has generated a new collection uh, that is just specifically for these brand new uh, OERs. Uh, so these initiatives we're offering as funded supports to faculty and educators to continue growing open at their institutions, as well as helping the broader educational sector in the province. Wow, yeah, that's... I, I'm always impressed by what's happening happening uh, in British Columbia and in Ontario because uh, I feel like these are some of the best models. Your two organizations, BC Campus and eCampus Ontario, or Eco as I'm now calling it, um, are some of the are some of the best models we have of sort of you know I guess government funded right uh, consortia that that do this kind of work because I feel like in the United States. We don't really have, I mean, there's a couple of states where there are some initiatives, but we don't have anything as broad based and as thorough. Um, I see, I see Remy making a gesture there. Maybe you have a different, a different example that you could pop in. I'll just mention briefly and I'll throw the chat in that we do have an initiative here in, in Colorado, but it's not as robust as what you're describing. And I really appreciate the perspective that is coming through here. So, so thanks again. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, if we just think about that uh, from e Eco's perspective, if you will, do you mind if I call it Eco? Is that okay? No, <laughs> is that what you guys do. call it? We do internally, so I don't know if it's a if it's a broad thing. <laughs> well, Rajiv brought it up, so we can. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Then we're good. <laughs> yeah. Um. So at, at 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 Eco, you you are government funded. Is that right? Uh. Yeah. We're we're supported by the Ministry of Colleges and Universities. Yeah. And is that um. Is that funding that you have to sort of fight for to make sure happens every year, or is it relatively safe? Um, it's um, it's it's sustained. It's it is a sustained funding, um, but it's on an incremental basis. Um, so it it has been. Um, it I, I believe it has been. Um, 
somewhat of a process, but uh, that that funding is still coming through. Uh, we we didn't have as much funding for VLS round two as we did for round one, um, but uh, it's still it's still coming through. That's good. And so is it, it's not like uh, the very existence of eco has to be fought for every single year. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, not every single year. Uh, yeah, the, the changing governments is a little bit kind of crazy from time to time, but I guess that's kind of the same for everywhere, but yeah. Yeah, that's and that's always been one of my concerns about government funding, right, is if it is uh, tied to any particular party or ideology or something like that, that it could, it might lose its sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also wondering in the in the Ontario uh, in the Ontario context, um, do you work across public and private institutions? Um, no, right now we're we just support the publicly funded uh, institutions. So all of the colleges, the universities, uh, and our Indigenous institutes. We have nine of them currently. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And is it? Um, do you feel like um, you have different sort of successes getting open education at these different institutions, or are they are they sort of all enthusiastically on board with the open movement? It's it is a it is a big um, it, it is a mixed bag. I'll say that because um, some places are you know full in. They're they're adopting. They're adapting. They're um, there are some institutions that have developed um, labs based on uh, OER creation and development. Some are student run, uh, so they're employing uh, their co-ops and and work integrated learning experiences. And then there are others that are a little bit slower um, to, to jump on the train. Um, but uh, overall, um, these recent initiatives um, have, have really given a, a push in, in a positive direction for, for OER in Ontario. Um, yeah, it's, it's just been incredible just to see how it's exploded in the last couple of years. And I don't mean to hog the, the conversation here. If, if other folks have a question for Alyssa, that's great. I have, I have one more just to follow up. Um, it sort of comes from our, our stock list of questions that we're interested in exploring. And that's like, um, where do you see the most friction in uh, the adoption of open education in Ontario, or at least at the public institutions in Ontario? Uh, what, you know, what's standing in the way of its growth and, and expansion? Um. I've seen a few things. I think it's. I think a big, um, a big part of it is nobody really knows where to start with policy and and and, and procedure. Um, so, you know, uh, at my former role, I was heavily uh, involved with with trying to get a working group going, trying to get policy and procedure behind it, and creating a, a funded development program. Um, I have seen um, there be some friction from faculty who publish. Um, you know, they they publish with for-profit textbook organizations, and this just isn't their thing. Um, I've seen you know lack of resourcing. Um, you know, a lot in a lot of places, um, faculty development and and professional development is voluntary. So any sort of compensated um, development time where you're, you know, you're given funding, you're given uh, release time, any, anything that, you know, so it's not side of the desk work, um, that's really rare in a lot of places. Um, so I, I see those kind of as our, our main things to, to get over and, and we're hopefully gonna be overcoming that fairly soon. That's great. Yeah, I, I know that um, the sharing of policies across different institutions is, can be incredibly helpful as a way to sort of like um, build. <laughs> so we don't have to keep rewriting policies anew at each, in each case, right? Well, thank you for that. Let's um, let's actually, I'm going to pass the baton now. Um, and we've sort of gone through the guests um, alphabetically by family name. And so even though we, we've started in Canada, let's, um, if you don't mind, Lorna, because I believe you're next in the alphabetical list. Would you introduce yourself and talk about how you got involved in open education? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to be here and to see so many sort of familiar faces and names and also some new ones too. Um, so my name is Lorna Campbell and I'm talking today from Glasgow on the west coast of Scotland. Um, I'm actually currently employed by the University of Edinburgh over on the east coast, where I am the manager of the university's Open Education Resources Service. And I can say a little bit more about that later. Um, that is a role that I've had for five years. Um, I've been involved with open education, the whole open education space since 2008. At that time, I was working for an organisation called the Joint Information Systems Committee, which um, did a whole range of um, learning technology support activities across the UK higher education sector, including running development programmes. And one of those programmes was called the UK OER programme, which ran from 2009 to 2012. And I was one of the people who was responsible for setting the technical strategy uh, for that programme and also for supporting uh, the projects that were funded over about three years. I think there was about five million went into the programme in total, only for English universities. That was just a quirk of the way the funding, where the funding came from. Um, so just so I'm sure there, does that mean that like uh, areas like Scotland weren't included or Wales or what does that it, mean? It, I'm, I've lost so, track of where how England so the, defines the way itself. That, the way that um, higher education funding is devolved in the UK so there is a Higher Education Funding Council for England, there's a, uh, one for Scotland, there's one for Wales, there's one for Northern Ireland. They have their own funding and their own budgets. Gotcha. Um, the way the UK OER programme was funded was that there was an underspend in England and they used some of that funding to fund various projects. And in 2008, um, the idea of an OER programme was mooted and that's how it came into being. It was an interesting programme. I think it was quite successful in laying the groundwork um, for a lot of OER and open education initiatives in the UK. That was a very long time ago, though. Since then, I've been involved in open education as an open education practitioner myself, which is something I've had a, a long standing commitment to. And I've also been involved in with lots of other organisations that have an interest in this space. So I've, I've, I did some work with Creative Commons a long time ago on the, the LRMI initiative. That's my daughter going past. Um, I've also um, been on the board of the Association for Learning Technology, which is the professional body for learning technologists here in the UK and openness is one of their strategic um, priorities. And I'm also a trustee of Wikimedia UK and I've had some involvement with the, the Wikimedia community over the last sort of seven or eight years as well. So, so I've kind of got my day job, which is very much about supporting open education and OER, but I've also got um, a sort of, quite a sort of deep personal commitment to open practice and OER as well. And so it sounds like you've sort of, um, at least in your career, you've sort of been involved both in kind of consortial or, you know, multi-institutional work, but now yeah. a little more settled at Edinburgh, right? Yeah, very much. And it's quite interesting because this, I mean, I've, I've worked in, I've had a lovely conversation with, with Glenda when you did the breakout rooms and we, we bonded over the fact that we're both actually archaeologists by trade. <laughs> Oh really? Surprisingly, yeah. How <laughs> about that? Um, but uh, but yeah, I've um, I've had a sort of long career as a learning technologist, but usually in for sort of um, national consortia type organisations. So my role at Edinburgh is the first time that I've ever actually worked on an internal facing service. So it's quite interesting in that regard. And what would you say at Edinburgh? What what are what where is the momentum around open education right now? So, so there's 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 quite a lot of momentum. We're very lucky in um, Edinburgh. Edinburgh is a um, a very ancient institution. It's quite a well funded institution. It's very um, quite a prestigious un university, and we absolutely have the commitment of senior management to support open education. Um, the university's vision for OER was developed by my senior colleague, Dr. Melissa Highton, who some of you will be aware of. And um, we also had a lot of input from the university student union, who were also very keen that the university get behind open education. So in um, 2015, um, the university launched 
the OER service, the Open Education Resources Service, which is the service I now manage. And in 2016, it had formally ratified an OER policy for the university, which I'll be very happy to share in the chat just as soon as I finish talking. So we do have a formal policy and we do have a service. It always sounds very grand when you hear people talk about the OER service at the University of Edinburgh. You're actually looking at 50% of the service today. It employs, a grand to it employs about one and a half people. Um, so there's myself and my colleague, uh, Charlie Farley. Um, uh, she works full time. I actually work part time and I also work on other services. So we're actually a very, very small service in a huge institution. But we do have the buy in of quite senior management, which is is very important. And we see our commitment to open education as being part of a much wider commitment to open knowledge more generally, which includes working with our Wikimedian in residence. We've got an open data repository. Um, we publish open journals. We've oh. only just now started getting involved with open textbooks. Um, we create a huge range of MOOCs. I think we've got over 90 MOOCs um, and all the vast majority of the content that we create for our MOOCs, we also make available under open license so anybody else can take it and use it. So, um, so there, there is definitely a strategic commitment to openness and we see it as part of the university's civic mission and also a way to contribute to um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are one of the kind of key strate strategic drivers for institutions. I bet those SDGs, those uh, United Nations SDGs will come up again. I know Michael Michael will probably be speaking about them if no one else does, so that's great. Well, it sounds like there's a really um, kind of fulsome and well-rounded engagement with Open at Edinburgh. Um, it's interesting because so many institutions, I think, start with that OER as textbook replacement model, and mm -hmm. it sounds like you guys had a slightly different pathway. Yeah, I think the use of open textbooks is not common in the UK and there was a Hewlett funded project, oh, it was quite a while ago now, maybe about six years ago, which the, the Open University did. Um, we have a very different model of textbook use here in the UK. Um, it's it's rare for courses just to be folk, to be based around one textbook and by and large, the main textbook costs are carried by the library and not by the students. Most courses you will use multiple textbooks, like different bits of different textbooks. So it's just, it's a very, very different model of content use. So open textbooks didn't really ever take off in the UK in the same way as they did in North America because there wasn't the same demand. However, as a result of changes in the publishing sector, the results of the pandemic, e -text, electronic textbook costs have gone through the roof here. I mean, they're scandalous. Um, so many institutions are now, now only now starting to look at open textbooks as an alternative. So I think it will be interesting to see what happens in the UK over the next five years or so, because I think we will start to see much more adoption of open textbooks. Yeah, it's interesting that that move to digital in the proprietary publishing world sort of makes it more difficult to do the practices that you used to do right which was to yep. sort of like mix and match resources yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely so what would you say is uh are there what frictions or uh you know what's what's keeping open from growing at edinburgh it sounds like a almost like an ideal world for open but... I, th I think i think capacity is is one thing i mean like i said the oer service is, is very small um that we can only reach so many people with with just just the two of us um i think um time as well i think uh there's um workloads are a serious issue i mean the workloads are an issue i think in education the world over but there's you know that we are in a period of industrial action in higher education in the uk at the moment um with wait you know, sorry is industrial action a sort of labor movement yes, yes. okay so, sorry we call it something different over here so yeah so so industrial action covers a whole sort of range of activities from working to rule to actual full-out strikes to uh so yeah we are involved in a period of industrial action part of which was triggered by things like workload and pay disparities and contracts and terms and conditions and precarity and all these things. So um, I think we're quite lucky in Edinburgh. We're quite a well-funded institution, but um, there is there is a limit to how much um, additional work colleagues can take on. So we do work. We do try very hard to make sure that we're embedding um, support for open education and OER in the curriculum and in the workflows that already exist. 
so that it's not additional work for our colleagues and our students to engage in. And we do very see, very much see student co-creation of open resources as being a really important part of our work. Yeah, it's, uh, well, the student part is awesome, of course, but uh, uh, the capacity issue that you bring up, I think, is mm -hmm. so, so crucial, especially worldwide, where we see, you know, basically, a lot of times it seems like the people who can get heavily involved in open are only the people who have the privilege of having yes. the time and resources to be able to do it because it's not compensated. Ab absolutely. And it, and it is quite interesting that I think a lot of people will look at Edinburgh and see a, see a you know, quite prestigious, well-funded university and say, well, it's easy for Edinburgh to do it. But as I said, we are just, you know, we're a very, very small service. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot that can be done with quite minimal resources, but it obviously does depend on the overall culture of the institution. For sure, yeah. Well, you guys are, um, I've known Melissa for a while too, and you guys are, are definitely stars in that department. So thanks for all the work that you do. Yeah, so you're welcome. Um, we'll come back, of course, to more general discussion, but um, if it's okay, I'd like to pass the baton, Glenda. Of course. Alphabetically, you come up next. Are you comfortable with that role? Yes, that's totally fine. Thank you. Hello, yeah, so, everyone. Oh, so you you, you you have a prepared speech already. Otherwise, I could reiterate the sort of questions. Um, I kind of have an idea. So I'll just okay, go for it. About my, my role first, and then what's happening at UCT, um, a little bit of the story of UCT and Open. Um, I have been involved in Open Education since around 2010. Uh, background, as, as Lorna said, archaeologist, moved into education, did a lot of staff development work for a while, um, and um, in the Centre for Innovation and Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. And that unit supports teaching and learning across the institution. So my role in open education is technically only supposed to be one, one day a week, <laughs> which it certainly is not. Um, because it's my passion. So I, I teach and I do all the regular academic um, functions, um, but, but openness is definitely my passion. And I yeah, started off the role, um, started to get acquainted with, with the Open Education Global initially, um, what was the Open Education Consortium, going to some conferences and so on. And at the time, uh, you know, it was really under pressure to do a PhD. So I joined GOGN, the Global OER Graduate Network. There are other um, people here, are also members, very proud members of GOGN. And I started off um, back in the days when Fred Mulder was, was still um, in charge, back in 2013. And so I did my PhD in, in open education. And it was a sort of theoretical explanation of why people share and why people don't share. Um, and so that was was my PhD, and sort of since then, not looked back. Um, we've had yeah, been involved in very big projects, research projects um, out of UCT. So we have, at, so just to sort of move, okay, I suppose a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm currently heading up a digital open textbooks for development project at UCT. Um, and most recently, at the end of last year, uh, UCT has a um, UNESCO chair in open education and social justice, which was previously held by Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams. And she retired, unfortunately. And uh, we needed someone to sort of fit the role. And because all of my open textbook work is underlabored with social justice, it became a kind of natural place for me to continue my research, building on the open, you know, the, the open background that I had, but actually moving into looking at the role of open textbooks for social justice. Um, so I have this UNESCO chair that I received at the end of last year, which doesn't come with any money, unfortunately, but does come with lots of connections and hopefully networks. And, and so I'm sorry, Maria is not here because I met Maria now recently and we've been working together. Um, on some projects. So wonderful network building building option. Um, yeah, so that's so UCT has a open UCT repository that has uh, journals in it and it has um, open education resources in it. But really the story of UCT is external funding. So um, it might look like um, you, the university itself has bought into open, but it really has been a kind of middle management, 
passion in our unit specifically, led by people like Cheryl Hodgkins-Williams and Laura Chenowich, who have sourced external funding like Mellon Foundation funding, um, a lot of money from the IDRC. We were very fortunate there uh, with a big Global South um, project, raw for d Research and OER for Development. And when that project ended, the IDRC said, well, you know, what, what would you like to do in terms of, of other projects to help grow open at UCT? And we said, we would like to start open textbooks. So we started that project in 2018. So I suppose also relatively recent um, introduction of open textbooks, but something we've always wanted to do because it, it seems to really resonate with people, this idea of an open textbook. And we started that project and the project was inspired by open textbooks for social justice. So not only saving cost, but also uh, recognizing cultural attributes and bringing political voice and collaboration into creating materials. Um, so we've been, we've been very busy with that. But the, so, the, so this funding story is that this was all externally funded, almost no UCT funding whatsoever, uh, various DVCs sort of vaguely sort of acknowledged that we were around, um, yeah. even the Open Education Global Conference, the Vice Chancellor then came to do a talk, but it was, it was really just for show kind of thing. Um, and then most more recently, we've had a fantastic Deputy Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning who's really, really got it. <laughs> I don't know if you sometimes feel that about top management sometimes it's kind of oh we don't really understand you know will this make money for us what is this really going to do and she was just right from the beginning like open textbooks this is it so she for the first time um we had an open textbook award that she took money out of her personal fund to to do for three years so this is the third year which is fantastic really nice advocacy and we've had some great winners so far but of course as the story goes she's leaving so she, the politics up at the top, but a little bit much for her. And, and unfortunately she's leaving. So our champions is going and now we have to kind of start almost again now or try and build on what we've grown in, you know, into. Um, so it's, it's looking a little bit more positive. We have now some other, you know, Lorna was just talking about herself. I also have two other colleagues now. That's the most I think we've ever had. So those other colleagues mostly work on, on open textbooks and open, te and open research. Um, so we're in a better place than we've ever been. But certainly the, the issue is around um, that we just don't have the resources for staffs. You know, what Lorna said, we have, you know, if we had to put out a call now and say, here are small grants for open textbooks, which we did do as part of the IDRC project, we had small grants, we had really nice implementation grants, you know, that money's gone, we would have such an enthusiastic response because people are so, can really see how this can make such a difference, especially with the sort of global South imperative of, of curriculum transformation currently. Um, there's a real call for that. So anyway, let me not, I think that's probably Yeah, nice. I mean, one thing you've really, you've had on there, Glenda, that uh, really resonates. And just in case people don't know, UCT is University of Cape Town, right? <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm not, not sure that we actually mentioned that. Um, but this issue where, you know, um, open becomes hinged on particular personalities. They might be like in middle management, as you called it, or leadership. And then those people move on. And so I think we do see that pattern where, um, you know, open seems to more uh, sort of like hooked to individual people as rather than being institutionalized in into the frameworks of the places that they work more and that seems like it can it can cause additional friction so is that that's something of what you're describing there at UCT it sounds like yes um you know because we've been you know UCT's been doing open since around about 2007 of course with the Cape Town open declaration that was kind of came out of of UCT um, academics collaborating with other academics around the world. Uh, so there's, there's is an awareness, but it's still a small group that, you know, across the four and a half thousand staff, you know, we're probably looking at 300 staff that are, are really sort of aware and engaged. Um, and it would be great if we could grow it further. 
Um, so UCT just, is a fairly large institution then, right? What's what's the rough count of the students? Yeah, around about 28,000 undergraduates. Pretty large uh, then, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's sizable. Okay. And we've tried students involved. Anyway, that's another, it's a bit of a conversation we're trying to go, we're trying to go into more now. But I mean, you know, somebody mentioned, I think Alyssa, you mentioned that student involvement, like students calling for open. Uh, we've really tried to mobilize students, but not very successfully, um, unfortunately. The other so, thing that, that really so resonates happy, with- not so happy. Oh, yeah. The other thing that really resonates with what you're saying is that a lot of people, I think, when it comes to open educational resources, get focused on the cost issue, which is obviously important. But you've also brought in issues of, um, you know, how OER opens possibilities for different kinds of content or different orientations of content, like social justice issues being brought into the curriculum. And that seems really important. Well, in the interest of time, let's move to the next, uh, our next guest in the order of family names of the alphabet, and that is Rajiv. Hello, Could you introduce friends. yourself and and talk, talk about uh, open education at your institutions, I think we might even say? Certainly, and, and thanks for that, <laughs> that prompt. Um, I'm very, very of course, grateful to be joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory this morning of the Squamish Nation in British Columbia, uh, where I have the privilege of living, working and playing. Um, I currently serve as the Associate Vice President for Teaching and Learning at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, which is a public undergraduate university in BC, about 20,000 students or so with five urban campuses. Um, but what uh, Nate is gesturing towards is uh, my new role that I will begin uh, on the 1st of August, uh, working much more closely with Alyssa and her team at ECO uh, at Brock University in St. Catharines uh, in Ontario. And for those of you who know the, the amazing work of people like Julia Forsyth, for example, it has an, an incredible, vibrant community that uh, I imagine we're all excited to roll up our sleeves and see what's possible over there with open. Um, but uh, just, I, I suppose, to kind of hit, in, hit on your questions quickly, um, you know, at KPU for short, um, there's, there's a lot that we have been doing, of course, and in some ways, I think we're incredibly privileged to be in a, in a position where we have had um, strong and growing grassroots interest in, in open education. Uh, but at the same time, it's been paired with uh, a real deep understanding and appreciation for the benefits of open educational practices more generally from senior leadership. And so over the last decade or so, my job has been to marry the, the two of those forces. Uh, and so certainly, you know, when it comes to things like forming our open education working group, running an OER grants program to support uh, our faculty. Uh, we publish a lot of open textbooks uh, through a fairly robust and increasingly professional uh, open publishing program uh, to support for faculty who want to engage with teaching and learning practices that are infused with openness, what we call open pedagogy uh, for short, often. Um, to open ed research. So we have fellowships for faculty with open pedagogy, fellowships for faculty with open ed research. Uh, we run an open education research institute that some of the folks on, on the screen have participated in as well. And, and most recently we've been developing and uh, launching this fall um, a online self-paced, oh, well, uh, not exactly self-paced, but uh, fully online program, a professional development program in open education uh, that will be available for uh, educators, policymakers, leaders around the world to, to, to take part in. So I would say in, in many ways, you know, knowledge of the, the special position of, of KPU and just in terms of that advantage of, of strong grassroots support, but strong grass top support as well, if you will, um, allowed us to kind of try to use KPU as a, as a case where Let's try to show people what's possible uh, within the context of an institution that reaps the, the benefits of this. And I don't just mean in terms of cost savings to students, because certainly KPU has Canada's first zero textbook cost programs, or ZTC programs for short. Uh, at this point, eight complete credentials, including a couple of bachelor's degrees, uh, almost a thousand individual ZTC courses, more than $8 million saved for students. Amazing, of course, but uh, more to the point, uh, it's also an, uh, an educational impact. Right, so semester upon semester for the last four years of this program, uh, across every faculty, we've seen gains in course enrollment, course persistence, course performance uh, across the board. So it's not just that students are saving money, it's that uh, students are benefiting in both educational and economic terms. 
Um, and so certainly my own involvement in open ed uh, goes back a decade. And, and when Clint gets to talk about, no doubt, the open textbook project launch in, in BC 10 years ago, uh, you can blame Clint in many ways uh, for, for a lot of uh, my, my work in open ed. Um, we were laughing about this last week uh, when we saw each, we saw each other in person as well. Uh, but I was one of those sort of rural early faculty members who reviewed open textbooks, adapted them, adopted them, uh, and then it suddenly you know changed everything. Um, I was laughing at Clint last week to say, you know, I was happily minding my own business as a psychology professor, uh, and then BC campus came along um, and changed everything. So uh, certainly a lot of research on <clears throat> OER, uh, you know, perceptions, efficacy, uh, institutional capacity, open ed practices more generally, social justice issues, uh, and of course, becoming an advocate over time, working with, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of institutions around the world. Uh, collaborators, including, of course, uh, Glenda, who's uh, who's on the call over here, Clint, Mike, a lot of the people on the call, we've had to, we've been able to collaborate in various ways, Maha, uh, Jonathan, um, uh, and of course, especially Robin DeRosa, my partner in crime fighting uh, from Plymouth State University and, and our work on the Open Pedagogy Notebook. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose that's, that's a little bit of it. Um, and I was thinking about your question as well, Nate, about, you know, even though KPU managed to do a lot, uh, what have been the frictions, the challenges? And yeah, certainly many, many things. I mean, it's certainly nothing happened quickly or automatically at KPU, despite the fact that we were the earliest recorded open textbook adoption in BC and had the strong senior leadership support. It, it took a long time and it was, you know, culture change conversation by conversation. And, and, you know, for me, part of it was embedding enough agency in our structural supports for open education to ensure that academic freedom was never being threatened. It was always an opt-in. This was not a mandated top-down initiative, but it, my job was really to make sure that folks who wanted to embrace openness were not swimming against the current. So it was really changing that, that tide in that way. Um, and also the research, I would say, <clears throat> constant research to ensure that the work was always uh, based in evidence, but the nature of an institution, and, and this is, I, I suspect, going to be one of our broader discussion points, when you have a, an institution that is open access, that is teaching focus, it's a lot easier in general. You're not swimming against the, the, the deeper current, in, in a sense. Um, but, you know, I would say that the key bit is demonstrating the return on investment from my own time initially, from a half-time release to a full-time release to, to do work for a year, um, and demonstrating what's possible. And so, weaving it into policies, procedures, practices, making sure that this happens on people's desks, not off the side of people's desks, not just a labor of love that then becomes, you know, that fades with the transition with somebody leaving the institution, right? So whether it's our intellectual property policy or our curriculum development procedure, where every new course that developed has to undergo a search for OER, even if they don't have to adopt it, um, to, to staffing is the big thing. So we, we now have two full-time open education strategists. Uh, we have a big team uh, that, that supports broader practices, a cross-functional open ed working group. But I would say, yeah, it's it's the really the 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 real key piece is is weaving it into the fabric of the institution. And that word also weaving reminds me of Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams' keynote at the Open Ed Global Conference a few years ago. All right. And, and, and that's really part of it is. This is not something that the institution, that few people are choosing to do. This is how the institution operates. Now, you, you know, you're free to participate by all means. You don't have to, but if you want to, it can be incredibly hospitable. So looking forward to seeing what's possible at, at Brock uh, with colleagues over there in, in the coming months. But I have no doubt that KPU will continue to be the, the juggernaut that it's become in terms of uh, open ed practices and openly licensing everything that they produce from teaching and learning. Yeah, you hit on, on a couple of things there, Rashid, that I think are so important and that, you know, when you focus on the um, sort of uh, having the institution recognize the return on investment, if you will, of, of open, um, especially uh, not just in terms of, you know, saving textbook costs, which is, of course, great, um, but also, um, you know, there are numbers, I think, generated maybe at KPU, too, about how um, student persistence and um, and uh, sort of success through their, uh, well, I guess that is persistence, right? Success through their academic programs um, is actually augmented by having open at the table. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, yeah, it reminds me of one of those fu funny memes, you know, I can, I can play with the meme, but I'd rather dance with the outlier, so that kind of thing, you know? So if you wanna have a conversation with me about social justice and open pedagogy, of course, I'll be there. But if you want me to translate 
the gains that you just referred to and, and tell you the precise dollar value of tuition that's been retained by the institution as a result of the differential persistence rates and ZTC courses and not, I will have that conversation with the Board of Governors Finance Committee, no problem. It sounds like you might have had it before, given how quickly you reeled it <laughs> off there. What's also yep. amusing is that you mentioned Robin's name and then suddenly she showed up. It was like you called her out of the internet and she she appeared. Oh, it was a bad signal, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. The bad signal went up. Well, that's so great, Rashif. So um, as we're just moving around the um, the introductory comments here, um, I'd like to move to our next alphabetical family surname, and that is Clint. And this is interesting, of course, because Rajiv mentioned several times that Clint's organization, BC Campus, was highly instrumental in the work that they did at KPU. So Clint's Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clint Lalonde. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm joining you today from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples of Esquimalt and uh, Songhees. I've been a settler here since 1994, uh, originally from Treaty 6 territory, which is the uh, territory of the Chi, uh, Chippewan, Cree, and Stony nations. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here today and to join this panel. What an uh, incredible group of open educators we have here uh, and talk a little bit about uh, open education and uh, our journey. Um, so uh, I'm really sad to see Rajiv leaving British Columbia. <laughs> He has been such a mover and shaker here in uh, in the province, and I know he's going to do great things in Ontario. Uh, and and of course, we'll continue to collaborate uh, as the nature of open. We'll make sure that we'll we'll uh, stay in touch uh, over the years. Um, I, I, I my my spiel will probably be a lot like uh, Alyssa's. Um, BC Campus, the organization I work for, is much like eCampus Ontario. In fact, we were um, headed at one time both by the same person in Dr. David Porter. Um, now at BC Campus, uh, our, our executive director is uh, Mary Burgess. Um, but uh, we were set up uh, originally in 2003, 2002. Uh, as a collaborator, as a way to bring institutions together to work on collaborative projects. We're funded by the Ministry of Advanced Education here in the province of British Columbia, and uh, our mandate is to work on collaborative projects uh, with all 25 of the publicly funded post-secondary institutions, um, KPU being uh, one of those institutions that we work really closely with. Uh, in terms of open education, we do a number of different um, projects throughout the province, um, but in terms of open education, we've been involved in open education for a very long time. Um, I had mentioned uh, Dr. David Porter, very uh, influenced by the MIT Open Courseware project when that launched, and so began a program here in British Columbia around 2004 called the OPDF, the Online Program Development Fund, right around the time when uh, online uh, courses were kind of becoming a thing. We, uh, the province recognized that uh, we needed to scale up uh, uh, the offerings and the skill sets uh, to offer online courses and online programs. Everything from, you know, there was not a very little pool of, of knowledge around designing online courses and programs at that time. And so, uh, the OPDF was one of the ways that uh, was one of the strategies to try to to scale up the entire post-secondary system within British Columbia, and it was quite successful. But at that time, the programs and courses that were being developed, because we have a mandate to serve all of the institutions, we needed to find a mechanism um, to allow them to share the content that was being created uh, as part of the OPDF uh, uh, funding uh, quite broadly. And around this time, uh, there was this uh, fairly new thing on the block called Creative Commons licensing, which uh, that and and uh, and some really influential thinkers in open education convinced us to to. Um, build open uh, licenses into those early OPDF uh, courses and programs. And, and so we did that and have been working in open education for um, close to 20 years now uh, in British Columbia. Uh, our big project right now is our open textbook repository. You can see, um, where are we here? 10 years. We've just celebrated 10 years uh, with our open textbook project. Uh, it's a government funded project that began in 2012. Uh, we now have a repository of close to 400 open textbooks, along with uh, a myriad of support um, uh, materials that we have created along the way. 
uh, things around creating accessible OERs, uh, how to how to infuse OERs with uh, with equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, indigenization guides, um, uh, numerous projects that have uh, spun off of the Open Textbook Project. Uh, and uh, we just uh, had uh, Rajiv and I were were talking about it. We were just at a, our first live event in three years on Thursday, which was our 10th anniversary live celebration, where we brought together a bunch of people who had uh, worked on the Open Textbook Project for the past 10 years. Uh, to celebrate uh, the 10 year anniversary and to announce that we have now um, saved students in this province uh, over $30 million in, uh, in textbook costs um, uh, through the Open Textbook Project. So that's kind of the key project that we work on. We have an entire production team. We do this mostly by providing grants. Um, so we try to address that, uh, that I, off the side of the desk um, notion where we provide uh, funding for the creation and adaptation of open educational resources. And we also provide a lot of support to uh, individual faculty or departments that want to take on uh, a doing an open education or open textbook uh, project. Um, we, we had started with open courses. Uh, open textbooks has been very successful. And actually, since the pandemic, um, we are now um, um, shifting our focus a little bit more back to open courses. Uh, there was a need for shareable courseware um, as everybody scaled up for online uh, courses. We, it became quite obvious that there was a, a need for, for, um, for uh, shareable open course uh, content. So we've, uh, we've, we've now started doing uh, content creation grants around open courses again. Uh, and, and we work very closely. We provide an instructional designer. Uh, we provide a, a consultant, an EDI consultant. Um, uh, and we've, in terms of our support models, uh, we uh, have recently been working on cohort support models. So whenever we do a grant program, instead of uh, having individual instructors uh, go through and, and have a project manager work one-on-one, -on -one, which we still do, uh, but we're trying to, to get groups going together in cohorts. So we might have five or six projects at the same time and have a single kickoff project for them and, uh, and do some, some early work with them as a cohort. We set up a, a chat space for, for anybody involved in the project in our Mattermost group uh, and invite uh, some cross collaboration rather than sort of having the one-on-one -on -one email support to try to, uh, to, to support um, uh, the group going through as a whole. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I've just like fire hosed you with a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a lot uh, and, of it to give. Yeah, uh, happy to happy to to chat more about any of these. Uh, I'm curious about that um, cohort model. I mean, first of all, it seems great because then it ensures that people aren't uh, sort of doing the work alone and they they build a community around it. Are those um, often uh, interdisciplinary cohorts, or is it focused on a discipline? Yeah, very much um, because our, our grants are um, sometimes we do targeted targeted subject area grants, but uh, a lot of the times they are, are more broad. Uh, and so we end up uh, cross discipline uh, with them and not only with uh, subject matter experts, but also with instructional designers at institutions who are working on a project or, or uh, technicians uh, or and, you know, ed techs that are working on a project or you know, we, can, we can get a whole bunch of people involved in those, uh, in those cohorts and we make them as wide open uh, as, uh, as we can and invite everybody to uh, come along. Uh, the last project that I was involved in was our H5P project and our open homework systems project. Uh, that ran for two years. Uh, and uh, I brought on, um, some of you may know, Alan Levine as, a, as sort of a community coordinator for that. And we had an open website that we had set up and Alan was posting content there around H5P, as well as, you know, helping the conversation uh, within the, the community. And we, uh, we've now used that as a launching point for a broader H5P community within the province uh, that, uh, that has spun off of that, uh, that particular project. And, and we have uh, tons of different disciplines. We have tons of different uh, you know, roles uh, represented in that group. So it's like a, a move to not only support open textbooks, if you will, but also open interactives. Yeah, we're seeing this as sort of a, a, so we started our open homework systems project with the idea of trying to get something a little bit closer to courseware. We use um, a platform called Pressbooks as our main publishing platform, uh, which is uh, really just a WordPress with uh, some nice um, bells and whistles in it. Uh, but because of that, we can add in tools like Hypothesis, which I know you're very familiar with, uh, H5P, to try to move away from this static textbook idea and get into more interactive courseware as we see it as sort of a, a progression from a textbook. It's a, 
it's very um, easy to go from a textbook to a course, uh, but we want to try to address um, what we're seeing is, is a publisher's move into the, the sort of interactive uh, homework system and courseware space where students are now, the cost for students is being offset. Um, you know, the, it used to be textbooks were very expensive and now it's courseware platforms and often courseware platforms that are not only expensive for students, but also do things, you know, like collecting student data. That I mean, you know, there's some other issues along <laughs> with that. So, um, so we looked at this and, and decided to do an open homework systems project on, in the hopes that we can eventually get to some place where uh, we can we can compete with publishers uh, uh, in that in that space that courseware space. It conjures back to what I think Lorna was touching on uh, when she was speaking about uh, you know it's not it, it wasn't until the move to digital that the cost issues and really the capture issue, if you will, like I think you're speaking to, started to become an issue at Edinburgh. Um, hey, so before we move to Michael as our last guest, um, Clint, when you look at, uh, you know, obviously a lot of success in British Columbia, when you look at the friction there for further adoption and growth of open, what is it? I mean, is it funding? Is it capacity? Is it policy? Um, yeah, it's, it's all of that. <laughs> it always will be all of that. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, success. I know that um, this year has been particularly um, difficult in the terms of funding within our province. Um, and I think, you know, all the institutions and, and all organizations are finding this coming out of COVID that uh, there are some real financial challenges. Um, normally, our, our, our base funding for our operations are, are, are solid um, from year to year, but where we tend to lose when times are tight is sort of that discretionary grant funding. Um, so to do specific OER creation grants or to do um, zero textbook projects. Um, and so that that piece has been, you know, is a little bit more precarious. There's only been twice where we haven't received that funding this year is one of those. But I expect, uh, you know, we've now got some wins under our project. We, you know, our funders look at us as really a good news project and, and we're supporting student learning. Um, through this, the, the cost savings. So, you know, it's easy enough for us to, like Rajiv said, if, you know, I can sit down with the finance people and make the, make the case that this is financially a really good investment um, for the province. And there's also, you know, for us being a system-wide collaborator, you know, we see ourselves as kind of a, a neutral party. We don't represent single institutions. We don't necessarily represent the government. We just represent what we feel is best for the system and bring people together um, uh, to, to work in sort of a, a neutral environment, which is really important when you're doing system-wide projects. So, uh, you know, we've been a, a collaborator for many, many years, uh, and I think there's a great deal of value in bringing people together uh, at, to create this e ecosystem of open that we have here in British Columbia it has been the result of bringing people together to work on open projects. And I think that, you know, we, we can make the case that this is important. So... Um, for that, for us, that's that's a key piece. Um, continuing work around equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, um, that's a key piece. Um, uh, trying to uh, trying to infuse that in everything that we do, and and really look at uh, really look at all of all of the projects that we do. Um, but in terms of you know capacity, we could always use more capacity. Uh, but you know where we came from. <laughs> 10 or 15 years ago, I'm seeing incredible capacity. Institutions like KPU that now have entire departments that are, that are dedicated to open education. And KPU is not the only one in the province of British Columbia. And you know, I think that has just been uh, a lot of sustained, consistent work uh, within the system to, to really, um, for lack of a better word, sell the value of open. That's interesting how there are these pockets, you know, whether it's Edinburgh or British Columbia or Ontario or whatever that really seemed or UCT that sort of take on these um, this work and really move it forward locally in, in such strong ways. Well, and on that note, um, last but not least, we get to our final. Thank you so much, Clint, by the way. Sorry, I don't mean to rush uh, mm -hmm. rush away, but I want to make sure that um, we invite Michael Mills to the stage here. Um, so, Michael, uh, a little bit about you and your institution and your engagement and open to start off with um, and then, you know, sort of what's happening and um, where the frictions are would be great to hear. Sure. Thanks, Nate. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to join this panel. It's, it's been great listening to these wonderful colleagues. So um, 
I'm at Montgomery College. We are a multi-campus uh, community college right outside Washington, D.C. in Montgomery County. And we've been involved in the open space oh, since about the 2013, 2014 timeframe. But it, I remember giving a workshop on open at that time. And I think I may have had three or four people show up. Uh, they they really struggled with the concept. I, I think, you know, if I remember correctly, uh, the big takeaway was was showing them Merlot and half of them just knew Merlot as a wine um, and not any sort of repository. Uh, and so we struggled for a couple of years uh, in that vein until 2017 when we had the opportunity to receive a grant uh, from Achieving the Dream to put a degree up in, in open. And uh, that really kicked us off. And, and we chose a general studies degree to do that because all of the classes required for that general studies degree were part of other degrees. And so we, we used that as a springboard to really uh, launch uh, four or five, six other degrees and, and several certificates. Uh, and as this, this grew, what we, we found is that we didn't have to mandate any of this because the students started mandating it for us. They, they would question why their professor was charging or teaching a class that required a $300 textbook, but their friends were taking a class that didn't require any textbook cost. And so that, that was a big help for us. And over the years, we, we now average each semester about 600 sections of, of OER Z courses. And we've been able to save students about $9 million uh, at our institution. And that's all well and good. And as Rajiv said, you know, it's great to save students money. That's the sexy part of this. That's what our board of trustees likes to hear. That's what our senior administrators like to hear. But it became less about textbooks and more about access for us because we were finding that even in a wealthy county like Montgomery County, there were students who simply could not afford the cost of, of textbooks. And as a result, they couldn't afford the cost of, of education. So we, we shifted our focus to one of, of social justice and access. And that, that's been a really big help for us to sell the concept to our faculty um, if they had any questions. And so over the past couple of years, we've been focusing more and more on the, the social justice aspect. Uh, as Nate mentioned earlier, we do do a lot of work uh, with the SDGs. We have a faculty fellowship where uh, faculty learn how to create renewable assignments centered around the SDGs. And we've been able to expand this fellowship to now include nine international partners. And thanks to Rajiv helping us kick this off in 2018, uh, We've now added several other institutions from KPU or from uh, Canada, several in Arizona. We just added an institution from Aruba and one in Costa Rica this year. And it's, it's really been a great journey to see these interdisciplinary teams create assignments around the SDGs. And while that's exciting enough, it's, it's really, the benefit to the student where they are placed at the center of the learning process. They, they get to help choose the assignments and what that looks for them. And they take great pride in demonstrating how to make changes within their own community. Uh, we've expanded our social justice work to include a social justice ambassadors program at Montgomery College where we have faculty and students join together to create renewable assignments around social justice issues within the discipline. So it's a joint program. Uh, students have a lot of say in that program and in the creation of those assignments. Uh, so it's really just a, a, a lot of fun work centered around social justice. Uh, like Clint mentioned, we're doing a lot at Montgomery with H5P. Uh, we've launched an H5P collaborative in Maryland. 
and where we've invited private, public, two-year, four-year schools to join together to create these interactives that then can be made open. Uh, Alan Levine's been a big help in, in helping us kick that off. He's, he's a, a great friend, great colleague. Um, and then also we're um, using press books a lot more to include those interactives and allowing faculty the opportunity to create their, their own textbooks. Most of the work that our faculty are doing at this point is adoption and adaption, not necessarily creation unless it's around the H5P mark. Um, but it's, it's, it's good to see the growth and we look forward to, to continuing that um, as we move forward. That's great. You know, I was just, um, I'm seeing people pipe in about the, the sustainable development goals in the chat and Orna, it sounds like there's work at Edinburgh. Um, had you heard of the work uh, at Montgomery College before? I had not, but I'd love to hear more about it. It sounds really interesting. I'll, I'll connect with you, Lorna. Sure. Absolutely, please do. Yeah, and I was really, uh, you know, I know you started there at Montgomery with with that work, but the, to see it expand to be multi institutional and, and international uh, seemed like such a promising, such a promising um, sort of occurrence. Um, did and would you say that um, the the main sort of uh, sort of focus of energy at Montgomery now is around that uh, that curricular creation. I, yeah, it is. And it's, it's around that social justice aspect. Um, and we, we had faculty, for example, do some work uh, centered around Juneteenth, which, you know, being celebrated, honored today in the United States. So there's there's been a lot of work around the the social aspect of, of OER and what that means for our students. Uh, the friction point is still time. It's, it's trying to find time to, to do the work. And I think as we've been so engrossed in COVID and coming out of COVID, faculty are so burned out, they're so tired, even compensating them isn't enough anymore. Uh, it's, it's time, they just, they, they wanna recover some of the time that COVID took from them and, and all the work that they had to do during that time frame. Uh, so for us, the, the friction point is just time and capacity, I think. Yeah, it sounds like capacity is something that keeps coming up <laughs> for sure. And I mean that that's part of one of the reasons why we wanted to gather this this week's theme was around how can we make open more sustainable and not have it rely so much on individual personalities. Like every almost everyone here mentioned Alan Levine. Like what would what would open be without that one person who's done so much for it, right? Um, but we can't just continue to rely on one person worldwide to make certain technology magic happen, right? And we, we need to broaden it out on that. So we have about uh, just about 15 minutes left. And I know I've been talking a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, as each guest has sort of um, said their their piece or spiel, as Clint said, um, I'm wondering, uh, do any of our guests or anyone in the audience have like particular questions around the sustainability of open that they would like to kind of bring up for discussion now? I can chime in with a with a brief point, Nate. Um, just because it's coming to mind in part because of the chat conversation about um, justice for contingent faculty on the one hand, and your question about sustainability for, for open, uh, which is I think one of the things we've been thinking a lot about at KPU, and I imagine this is something the broader movement is to grapple with, is to the extent that you know people are dealing with capacity constraints and there's a lot of good work in open ed still happening out of, you know, the out of a labor of love effectively. Uh, that makes it unsustainable, sure, but it also, I fear, means that we are inadvertently reinforcing the same inequities that we are seeking to eliminate. And so, for example, what I mean by this is if the creation of open textbooks as one form of OER, but any kind of OER really, um, continues to be a voluntary labor of love uh, that is undercompensated or uncompensated, for example, among, among faculty, the decision to openly license one's inter intellectual property gets reserved for those who have sufficient privilege or wealth to, to do so, to forego that income. And so the ideology that's represented within available text available OER becomes overrepresented with privilege. So that's one of the examples I think of where there is this undercurrent where we can do harm with the best of intentions. Yeah, rah, 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 let's openly license everything. But is 
the privilege of publishing openly equally accessible to all, I think is one of the, the critical issues for me. Rajiv, if I could just follow up on that, one of the issues that we're, we're seeing with our adjunct faculty is that with, if they do adopt or adapt or even create some of their own work, there's no guarantee that they're gonna be able to offer a course the following semester, right? So they, they put all this work in and then enrollment's not, may not be what we want them to be. So all this work goes for naught until they are able to teach it. And then they have to go back and update it anyway. So it's, it's again, a, a labor of love that is just exasperated as time goes on. And I think Leo brought it up in the chat too. Maybe he might pop in and if he's still there uh, about, you know, just the contingent faculty and their relationship to this work um, is a very, a very tricky situation. Did you want to pop in, Leo? Hi everyone. I didn't really have um, a lot more um, to add. I, I I just think that that so much so much of this work isn't isn't compensated and isn't appreciated, um, particularly by those who. Um, who hold the, the purse strings for things um, and those who are able to give recognition and reward. And that's one of the reasons, um, I guess, that that's um, kind of central to my research into what institutions are doing to enable open education or, as the case may be, not doing. Yeah, that, that brings up an interesting question. I was trying to put it in chat, but um, does any institution here actually recognize work on open in their promotion and tenure policies? Edinburgh I see Rajiv does. nodding. Edinburgh does, well. okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and one, if I can pick up on some of the points that were being made there, I think um, certainly the issue of reward um, is one that absolutely needs to be addressed. Um, one of the things that we do in Edinburgh is we do quite a lot of work around um, the development of digital literacy skills in relation to open. And one of the things that we stress is that particularly for colleagues who are employed on precarious contracts or short term contracts or early career academics, if they can get the this, this stuff that they create out under open license, it means that if their contract ends or they have to move on to another employment, they will still have access to the material that they created um, while they were employed by the institution. So it actually, the sustainability angle is for the institution, but also for the members of staff who are actually creating that content. And similarly for the students as well, who are creating open content through their coursework assignments. But in terms of um, uh, career recognition, um, Edinburgh does have um, criteria for promotion for teaching staff. I'm kind of struggling with this a little bit because I'm not teaching staff myself. Um, but um, so within those criteria, it's exemplars of excellence is what it's called for different um, uh, moving between different grades as uh, teaching staff. And one of those exemplars of excellence is creating content that can be used by others out with the institution, including open education resources. So that is actually written into the promotion rubric. Whether it's been used or not, I'm, I'm not sure, but it, it is there. Great, and I see people are starting to use that raising hand feature in Zoom. Um, thanks for that, Lorna. Uh, Jonathan, you have your hand up. Yeah, just to follow on what Lorna was saying, I mean, it's not only sort of displaced in time that can cause injustice if you don't control the licensing over your the curricular materials. It's also displacement in space. A lot of contingent faculty, at least in the United States, are we call them road warriors. They teach at several different institutions and they travel from place to place. And if they don't own the rights to their materials, as most contingent faculty don't by, by their contracts in the US, then when they teach one course in institution A and then they drive across town to teach the same course in institution B, they can't use their own materials from institution A. But if you had an institutional policy that all, this is what I put in an OER Beyond post that is now invisible on the net. But the, if, if you made a required policy that when, whenever works for hire meant uh, that the institution owned the rights, it had to be openly licensed, then they would at least have access to their own materials when they taught at another institution, right? It seems like it's such an elementary bit of justice. Um, yeah, absolutely agree, definitely. 
Yeah, and that's why I know uh, the work, now that I'm working at Creative Commons, a lot of the work that we do is to try to help institutions adopt those policies that do uh, mandate uh, open licensing in cases where the funding has already been provided, say, by the public um, for the work to begin with. So it should be publicly available. It doesn't necessarily completely erase the issue that Rajiv brought up, though, right? Because what we see here is we do, we're starting to see institutions uh, with privilege, certain kinds of privilege start to enact certain things like, you know, there's such a center of gravity in Edinburgh or there's such a center of gravity in British Columbia, but it's like worldwide, there's still an inequity on the institutional level, even for institutions that could get deeply involved. Yeah, maybe just to that last point of yours, Neil, I, and one of the things I'm always, I'm always struck by is where the often I would say, if not always, often where the, where the really kind of pioneering work, the groundbreaking work happens is in fact not in institutions that are more elitist in this space, right? Montgomery College is a shining example of a community college that has been leading the work in open pedagogy. KPU by no means is considered an elitist institution. We try actively not to be elitist in fact. And so it's quite fascinating to me that the forces are quite different. Like when I when I look at, at UBC, my alma mater, right? I, my wife teaches there as well. She's a faculty member in education. Um, you know, they are much more naturally inclined to create and publish OER than they are to reuse and adapt OER that's been created elsewhere. So you see these different undercurrents. And frankly, when I see leadership in open education, I often see it at institutions that actually recognize and care about teaching and learning. Um, so it's quite interesting to me. It's not quite the same always. Just a point about South Africa. So I suppose UCT would be one of those elitist uh, universities in this, the University of Cape Town and the structure of, of South Africa and Africa. But we also have, you know, this IP issue is, is a massive stumbling block. Uh, we have 26 public universities and only 21, uh, sorry, only four allow um, staff to have um, the, the license over their works. Uh, so that's, you know, and then we, we try and try, one of the things that we want to do is to try and share what we've learned and try and grow the network across South Africa. And, you know, the first thing that comes up is the fact that staff can't actually openly share their teaching materials because the university won't allow them to. Um, and we, we have tried to change that, but that's a big stumbling block. And that's, that, so for South Africa, that's a big issue because we've, we've just got these little pockets now of activity, but it's, you know, it's just not going nationwide, which would be a, a much bigger transformational change, which is what we want. You know, we want underlying structures to be disrupted. Um, and so I suppose the disruption would actually be the case of policy where all, all academics at all public institutions could actually have access to the materials so that they can share them. So... It's, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's a really, really a big problem in South Africa for us. Yeah. I mean, just in terms of sustainability and moving forward, um, it was interesting the idea with Clint with the your cohort model um, and Michael also your teams. And I, I definitely see just in the just in my small case study this idea of of collaboration and of of working together and the, the best examples that we have of open textbooks. Um, that have been sustained and been used are when people are really truly working together. Um, groups of three or four and then co-creating with students. Um, we've got some really powerful examples and, and they're not a lot of examples. We, we'd like to grow them more. But I think that, you know, if we can't get the funding, how can we still grow this? What should we be looking for? And if I see proposals or people suggesting open textbooks, it, it can, someone in isolation is just not going to work. Um, it needs to be a whole team working together. Makes it more difficult, not for the faint-hearted, working in the open and working collaboratively and going out of your comfort zone, working with students. Um, yeah, definitely not for the faint-hearted, but um, it's that teamwork and collaboration that's, that's important. And that we've also seen these kinds of cycles of time and I think that's, it takes time to do this. I mean, we've always all we say we've only been in, in, we've been in open for a long time, 10 years. Actually, it's not that long, really. And institutions are slow to change. I mean, my, my institution is very slow to change. 
So it's it's about these these cycles and collaboration so that the, the momentum can continue. Um, that's that's our idea of sustainability. Yeah, that was my. And I like I love this. Uh, maybe this we might even see it as an ending note here about the idea of bringing students into the work because um, I, from my point of view. One of the things that I've always found most compelling about open is not just that the materials themselves end up being open, which is, of course, great in so many different ways, but that when students are involved in the co-creation of materials, it then becomes an open educational practice just in the creation aspect rather than the use aspect. And I think that could be so powerful, as, as I, I know Michael was chiming in in the chat. There's lots more going on about that. Uh, so I, I do feel like... Um, uh, incorp incorporating more student activity into open is both a way to make it, um, you know, extend it as an educational learning opportunity, but also possibly as uh, at least some way to address some of the inequity issues that Rajiv has been so good about pointing out in the terms of that getting more people involved with more different viewpoints, even if they're at the same institution might uh, help uh, sort of like um, unpack some of the privilege that's built into the system as it exists. And I don't know if that's what you're seeing, Michael, at, at, uh, at Montgomery. It is. Uh, the, the students have, have, have really helped move our work forward. And when the faculty and the students co-present their work at either regional or national conferences and, you know, COVID, as, as bad as it was, one of the things it did do was provide a virtual environment for, for students to present their work at conferences that they would not have ever had an opportunity to attend. And so when you can have faculty and students co-presenting, it's really powerful for the students and, and it, it helps spread the word as of the work that's being done. So great. Well, I, I, I know that we have reached the uh, scheduled end of our time here. I don't actually have to leave right away, but uh, other people probably have things they need to get onto. So I want to give people a natural moment to, um, to say goodbye and take off. Um, would, uh, do we have any uh, goodbyes? We could even just let's go in surname order again. <laughs> Lorna. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to go off now. I think and uh, get some dinner and things ready, uh, but it was a, uh, it was really interesting to join you and it was um it's always really reassuring just to see how much commonality there is across the sort of open education communities across the world and it's you know it's it's always wonderful to hear other people's experiences of engaging with open education as well and to find the differences in those commonalities so yeah thanks very much for inviting me along today i really enjoyed it i'm so glad that you could make it thanks Lorna. glenda Thank you very much for having me here. It's been a real pleasure. I love the conversation. It's been so engaging. Nature, an excellent facilitator. I think you've all drawn us in and it's it's really been a lot of fun. And there's there's so many nice resources in the chat as well. So thank you everyone for, for sharing along the way. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Yes, and we'll be collecting those and sharing out the recording uh, as well as the resources that were shared as part of the, the open results of this, this gathering. So thank you, Clint. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, Rajiv. I messed up my alphabet. Or did Rajiv leave already? He had to go. Clint, that does leave you. I think Rajiv had to run. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, yes. And I'm unfortunately I'm going to have to run as well. But uh, I really appreciate the conversation here. It's so wonderful to hear and and connect with everybody who um, who I haven't seen for many years. <laughs> it seems <laughs> like uh, I'm really happy to have had this uh, opportunity and. Uh, and, and, and look forward to this being the first of many conversations over the next few years. Great. Thank you, Clint. And, and Michael, you, you got the final word as it is. Thanks, Nate. It was a wonderful opportunity. And as, as much as we talked about faculty and students collaborating, I would love the opportunity to collaborate with each and every one of you at some point. Uh, there's such a, a rich um, array of, of work that's being done. Uh, so super. Great conversation. Thanks. Great. Well, on that note, um, why don't we bring it to a close? I put a link in the chat there to the other sessions that we're going to be having as part of the open learning journey this week. Um, two really other exciting sessions. Um, one around, uh, again, 
we had kind of institutional perspective here today, but uh, uh, open learning globally perspective, um, some folks, and then actually some more hands-on kind of activity about actually planning and growing opening open at an institution um, with the editors of the OER starter kit for program managers, which will be the final session of this track. So thank you all for coming. Um, we'll call it to a close there. And uh, I hope that you have a wonderful evening, day, or morning as it continues.